First off, we have uh, Giuseppe Ferrandino, who is a metabolomic scientist here at Alstom Medical. Uh, so Giuseppe uh, will be talking about his work using breath biopsy to improve detection of liver disease. Uh, Giuseppe is postdoctoral at Yale School of Medicine in the US, where he contributed to discovering the link between hypothyroidism and nephilim. He was then at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics as a postdoc scientist. And in the two years there, he focused on the identification of a signaling pathway that promotes lipid accumulation in the liver. Uh, and Giuseppe has been with us here at Owlstone uh, since last year. So his talk is breath biopsy to discover novel exogenous BOC probes, evoke probes uh, for chronic liver disease. Over to you, Giuseppe, and thanks. Hello, my name is Giuseppe Ferrandino, and I am a metabolomic scientist at Allstone Medical. Today, I'm going to talk to you about breath biopsy to discover volatile organic compounds, VOCs biomarkers, for chronic liver diseases. This is an outline of this presentation. So I'm going to give you some introduction about chronic liver diseases. Then we are going to talk about limonene as biomarker for cirrhosis. And then I'm going to share some preliminary results about additional volatile organic compounds that have diagnostic performance for cirrhosis. Several factors can induce chronic liver diseases. One of these is excessive accumulation of fat in the liver without excessive consumption of alcohol. This condition is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and it's benign with uh, no symptoms often. But it can progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, also known as NASH, that is characterized by chronic inflammation. Then, accumulation of fibrotic tissue in the liver lead to cirrhosis. Compensated cirrhosis is a condition where the liver can still perform its physiologic function. However, cirrhosis can become decompensated and lead to several complications, such as hepatocellular carcinoma, liver failure, and hepatic encephalopathy. The compensated cirrhosis may require liver transplant and may lead to death. The old pathway of chronic liver diseases from an healthy liver to cirrhosis takes years to establish and often is asymptomatic up to the end stage. Chronic liver diseases are a global burden riding worldwide. For example, if we consider the United States and the main European country, more than 100 million of people are projected to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That will have dramatic effects on the healthcare systems of these countries. Given that these conditions are so widespread, what is the state-of-the-art diagnostics for liver diseases? In general, these conditions are detected by measuring blood biomarkers, for example, liver enzymes. However, this approach lacks sensitivity for, for early-stage diseases. The gold standard method for chronic liver diseases remains liver biopsy. However, uh, this uh, is a very in invasive procedure that can lead to complications and cannot be used as a screening test. There are other approaches such as ultrasound and CT scan or transient elastography uh, that are non-invasive. However, these uh, focus on measuring alterations of liver structure than measuring liver function. So next, we are going to talk about limonene as biomarker for cirrhosis. At Austin Medical, we aim to deploy bre a breath test for liver diseases that will be able to detect these conditions at earlier stages and non-invasively. But from where to start? So we started from the literature and found that different papers reported limonene as biomarker associated with cirrhosis. The current model states that limonene is a flavoring agent we are exposed to through our diet, and it is metabolized in the liver by the enzymes CYP2C9 and CYP2C19. However, when cirrhosis occurs, the activity of these two enzymes is downregulated, 
and therefore limonin accumulates in the body and its permanence in the bloodstream increases, resulting in elevated levels in the breath. Therefore, we could use limonin as biomarker for cirrhosis. So, from the studies I mentioned before, there are two of particular interest for us, from Professor Chris Mayhew, University of Birmingham. Here we can see, on the left, that patients with cirrhosis have elevated levels of limonin in breath compared to controls. However, after liver transplant, in some of those patients, levels of limonin normalizes in the week after, indicating that breath limonin levels are related to well-being of the liver. In a follow-up study, they stratified the patients by the presence of hepatocellular carcinoma. And they found that patients with cirrhosis have remarkably elevated levels of limonin in the breath. However, patients with HCC over the underlying cirrhosis have moderately elevated levels. The authors were not able to conclude if this difference is due to the presence of hepatocellular carcinoma or to an earlier stage cirrhosis in the patients with HCC. We answered this question in our study and I'm going to show you the results later. So these are some characteristics of our studies. So first of all, the goals. So we want a proof of principle that a breath biomarker could be used to detect cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. We wanted to validate the results from the literature. Estimate the performance and correlation with blood biomarkers and identify possible confounding factors. On the right, we can see some of the inclusion criteria. I would like to point you to the last row where we measured the severity of liver disease by using the Chalpug classification and included patients with the Chalpug A and B and matched the disease severity between patients with cirrhosis or patients who developed also hepatocellular carcinoma. This is an overview of how the breath biopsy assessment pipeline works. So breath biopsy have been collected at the Haddenbrooks Hospital by using the Receiver breath sampler. VOCs have been concentrated in sorbent tubes that then were shipped to Alston Medical for analysis. Together with the sorbent tubes, we received also several other data from the patients, such as eight, weight and uh, uh, blood metrics and other information. So at Austin Medical then we analyzed the VOCs by using state-of-the-art mass spectrometry uh, instruments and then we were able to uh, measure limonin and obtain absolute quantification against the limonin standards. And here are the first results. So, uh, as we can see, we found that patients with cirrhosis have elevated levels of limonin in breath compared to healthy controls. Patients with cirrhosis complicated by hepatocellular carcinoma also showed significantly elevated levels of limonin compared to healthy controls. However, they showed no significant difference compared to patients with cirrhosis. Given that cirrhosis severity was matched between the, these two groups, we concluded that probably cirrhosis is the main factor causing elevation of limonin in breath, and hepatocellular carcinoma has only a minor effect. For this reason, we gathered together the patients with cirrhosis and those with the cirrhosis plus uh, HCC in one single group for further analysis. Next, we explored the diagnostic accuracy of limonin for a potential test by building a rock plot that we can see here on the left. We measured an area under the curve of 0.78 and the UDEN index corresponding to levels of limonin in breath of 10.2 nanogram per liter. So we can see also the confusion metrics and some more data about performance of limonin breath test. Then we investigated if level of limonin in breath 
correlate with the blood biomarkers. But which one to choose? In this representation here, we can see that the limonin, once ingested, is biotransformed and excreted by the liver. Similarly, bilirubin, uh, a compound produced by the degradation of hemoglobin, is cleared by the liver. And when it is elevated, it's a potential biomarker of reduced liver clearance. Then, then albumin and prothrombin time expressed in INR are biomarkers representing the protein synthesis capacity of the liver. Then, alanine aminotransferase is a blood biomarker representing liver damage. And it's elevated in the blood as a consequence of uh, hepatocytes cell death. And therefore, we use the, these four biomarkers to see if there are correlations with the limonin. As we can see here, so limonin positively correlates with the bilirubin and also with the prothrombin time expressed as INR. On the other hand, limonin correlates negatively with albumin and showed no correlation with alanine aminotransferase. Now, uh, bilirubin, albumin, and INR can be used as a proxy biomarkers for liver function, and alanine aminotransferase can be used as a biomarker of liver damage. And these data indicate that um, limonin as well could be used as a proxy of uh, liver function. Then, given that bilirubin, albumin, and INR are used to calculate the child puke classification, we investigated the abundance of limonin in breath based on the child puke class. As we can see here, as expected, patients with child puke class B have elevated levels of limonin in breath compared to patients with child puke class A. Then we identified the possible confounding factors. So we found that uh, body mass index, diabetes, portal hypertension, and ascites had no effect on the levels of limonin in breath. However, of course, one of the confounding factors is exposure. We measured it by a crude estimation of asking how often the patients were drinking citrus product, such as orange juice. As we can see here, patients drinking citrus products daily had elevated levels of limonin in breath that were drinking them non-daily. We, we also investigated the impact of some drugs, specifically cytosinine and 19 substrates, which showed um, an effect on, uh, on levels of limonin in breath. Indeed, as we can see, patients in taking these drugs in the week before the breath collection showed significantly elevated levels of limonin in breath compared to those that were not taking the, those drugs. However, surprisingly, we found that the patients taking uh, cyptocinine and 19 inhibitors showed no significant differences. This may be explained by compensatory effects involving other CYP enzymes that may metabolize limonin. All those data have been summarized in um, a publication that just came out on clinical and translational gastroenterology. Last, I'm going to show you some preliminary results about additional volatile biomarkers for the diagnosis of cirrhosis. With the Orbitrap system that we have at Austin Medical, we can perform targeted analysis of uh, bread samples as I showed you before for limonin, but on the same bread samples, we can also perform untargeted analysis to identify additional volatile organic compounds. So these are just some preliminary results, but first we started to see if we could discriminate bread samples from uh, uh, the controls. As we can see here on the right, so we performed the principal component analysis, and we found that uh, breath um, cluster compared to quality controls. And then on the right, we can see another principal component analysis showing them breath samples 
can cluster also uh, compared to the blanks, indicating that uh, the system was working appropriately. And uh, basically, this is a first quality check to be performed to make sure that we are not measuring contaminants from the environment. So then uh, we identified some interesting features and uh, look if they were correlating with the uh, blood matrix of liver function. As shown for limonin, so we used the uh, INR, albumin and bilirubin. So this is a correlation plot where blue indicates positive correlation and red indicates negative correlation. At the intersection for each variable, we can uh, identify the type of correlation between the two different variables. As we can see for limonin, so as expected, it showed a negative correlation with albumin, a positive correlation with bilirubin, and a lower correlation with INR. Several other volatile organic compounds showed positive correlation with the limonin and similar correlation with blood matrix. The VOCs number three was downregulated in the breath of patients with cirrhosis, and we found, as expected, that this showed a positive correlation with albumin. Then we used the same features to see if we could discriminate patients based on the severity of the disease. We performed the principal component analysis, and as we can see, PC1 and PC2 represents more than 60% of variance. Also, here we can appreciate that patients with child puke score 5 tend to cluster with the healthy controls on principal component 1. However, patients with child puke 6 and above tend to separate on the first component. Represents alterations of liver function. In conclusion, we found that limonin is elevated in the breath of patients with cirrhosis. Occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma does not affect breath limonin levels. Exposure and drugs are confounding factors that influence the amount of limonin in the breath. Elevated breath limonin correlates with the cirrhosis severity and blood biomarkers representing clearance and protein synthesis capacity of the liver. Additional VOCs show correlations with blood metrics of liver function and may be coupled with limonin to increase diagnostic performance. With that, I would like to acknowledge all the colleagues from Austin Medical that contributed to this study and also the collaborators from the Addenbrooke's Hospital and uh, Professor Chris Mayhew from the University of Birmingham. And I would like to acknowledge also the Cancer Research UK, Cambridge Centre, Early Detection Programme and the International Alliance for Cancer Early Detection for uh, fundings. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any question in the Q&A session. Thanks for that, Giuseppe. So if you uh, start your camera and unmute your microphone, we can jump into questions. So there's one from uh, John who we'll be hearing from next. Yeah, it says limiting raised in liver disease, but uh, non cirrhotics. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Is limiting raised in liver disease, but non cirrhotics? Uh, okay, so we are going to test that. So for now, we, we only have data from cirrhotics, but uh, there is one paper in which they measured limonin in uh, uh, pre cirrhotic uh, uh, patients. And uh, they found that the levels were not elevated um, in, in those patients. However, we have to mention that these are steady state levels. So exposure was not adjusted. So yeah, probably maybe exposure was still lower than clearance. Okay, thanks. I have one question as well. So obviously in the initial results, the limonene was uh, coming in through dietary intake. So it was uncontrolled exposure. 
essentially. Can you talk a little bit about some of the plans for um, delivering a specific dose of uh, limonene uh, and what your kind of expectation is there in terms of you know, what, what we'll be seeing and what the likely performance is? Yeah, sure. So in our study, we were relying on random exposure. So of course, like this represents the clinical reality of a, of a setup, of the setup in general. However, um, so patients that were exposed not so much, so had the little exposure that was uh, lower than the uh, clearance capacity of the liver, probably had low levels of limonene in the breath. And therefore, this can reduce the uh, sensitivity of the system. Now, based on these observations, so yeah, we are asking the question, what happens if we standardize exposure before testing? So uh, what we see with limonene is that when people intake it, even healthy people, when they get it, so we see that uh, the, the levels of limonene in breath rises. However, uh, we also see a decay over time. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, this is probably due to liver function. So limonene is metabolized and therefore uh, it decreases in the breath over time. Now, the question is, the, this decay is going to be the same also in patients with the cirrhosis and uh, earlier stage of liver diseases, or they will have a slower decay. We hope in the second option because that would allow us to discriminate very well uh, uh, patients with uh, liver disease from healthy controls. As at earlier stage liver disease is the expectation. Sorry? Is that, do you mean earlier stage liver disease? Yeah, yeah. So um, in theory, if these metabolic pathways are impaired already in earlier stages, if we challenge them by giving a certain dose of limonene, which is higher than the, let's say, yeah, similar to the normal exposure, but we are sure that everyone is exposed, or limonene is a safe compound, so we can even give higher dose. So we can challenge these metabolic pathways and maybe be able to see more subtle differences between uh, uh, healthy and patients with earlier stage liver disease where maybe the metabolic changes are not so dramatic as in cirrhosis. There's a, a question from Andreas. Uh, so what are the compounds or substrates for, he says for the, for the sip of limonene, I presume he means the same sip enzymes that limonene target. Are there other substrates which are candidates for those sip enzymes? Uh, of course, there are other terpenes, however, so that, um, may be metabolized by uh, different CYP enzymes. So of course that will require more structured approach to identify which are the main CYP enzymes metabolizing specific uh, um, substrates. Because the literature is a bit confusing. So some compounds looks like are more uh, specific for CYP3A4, some other for CYP29 and CYP2, CYP2 uh, C19. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then there are also other compounds that are, so for example, partially, for example, ethanol is metabolized also by CYP2A1 in a limited way. So uh, basically, yeah, so there are different substrates, but we need a wider elucidation to understand if there are uh, compounds specific for the specific CYP enzymes. And do, do you think there's then an opportunity to multiplex some of these probes? Because obviously you, there's some stable isotopes, metathesin and the like, uh, that will target particular pathways. But it seems one of the limitations is if you have labeled carbon dioxide as your readout, uh, it seems that by multiplexing some of these probes that may get around some of those challenges. Have you got any kind of view on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, we can, uh, so the, the advantage of using non-labeled compounds, at least the compounds that uh, we don't measure the end product that is the same for every compound, so is that we can measure the compound itself, and therefore we can not only follow um, um, like um, limonene, for example, that is um, basically resulting from an altered CYP metabolism, 
but we could follow also other biomarkers that are altered, so that are metabolized by different metabolic pathways. So we can uh, um, multiplex different probes so that we, we will get an overall overview of, the, of different metabolic pathways in the liver. And there are some of these pathways that are producing VOCs. And we are now in the process of uh, uh, see if we can find probes for other specific pathways. Other thanks. There's one time for one last question. So were any of the patients in the study that have uh, hepatitis viral infections? Uh, okay, so there are studies. Um, uh, yeah, so there are studies for this kind of, um, um, of for, for hepatitis infection. And uh, so I can remember now out of my mind, some of them that were using metacetin breath, metacetin, metacetin breath test. Um, and uh, so what, were, what they were observing was that, so like uh, in more, so this kind of studies were giving uh, differences in a more advanced, advanced stage, but uh, yeah, were not so performant in earlier stages. Okay, thanks. I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions. Thanks again, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you.